we're continuing our <coughs> adventure in the book of Revelation. I think we're doing pretty well. I think we've been at it three or four weeks. We've gotten through about six verses. <laughs> Moving right along. I figure pretty well. I'm going to guarantee the rapture comes before we finish this book. Isn't that normal? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> so, um, we've been looking at uh, John's uh, greetings <coughs> to the recipients of his letter which uh, are the seven churches which we'll see in detail in chapters uh, 2 and 3. We've seen that he's extended greetings in the name of our great triune God in the name of the Father and the Son of the Spirit. <clears throat> and we've seen in his description of each of those uh, that he has described uh, Jesus as the faithful witness, as the firstborn from the dead, that is the most preeminent one, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the one who loved us and died for us that we might be cleansed from our sin, the one who has made us a kingdom of priests or kings and priests, the one who deserves all the glory and has all of the dominion forever and ever. And after that uh, introduction and greeting, he said, and he's coming. <laughs> Behold, he is coming in verse 7. And we looked at some detail in that because it is a major theme of Scripture, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've looked at the <clears throat> promises in the Old Testament that the Messiah would come. We looked at Jesus' promise that he would Return. We've looked at the requirements for his return, that is to fulfill his promise, but also to complete the work that's unfinished. There is a curse to be removed from the earth. We looked at that in, in Romans chapter 8. There is um, Satan to be defeated. There are promises to Israel yet unfulfilled. Uh, their king in the line of David is to reign from Jerusalem. He is to bring peace and safety and security and blessing to them. And they haven't received the land that was promised to them in Genesis 15, 18. Far greater land was promised than they have ever uh, realized. Yet. So he is uh, coming. In addition to that, he's coming because Titus 2 said he is our hope. The church, our hope is resting in him and his return. So he must come and he will come, irrespective of the scoffers that have always been there as we saw in Second Peter 3 saying where is the promise of his coming all things remain the same. He then says that he is coming, <clears throat> verse 7, with clouds. I know you don't want to stop there, but we're going to anyway, because I found it very interesting just how much the Lord likes clouds. In uh, the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, when asked what would be the signs of his coming before he would return, he said, Matthew 24, 30, He says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, which is, by the way, what we're going to be looking at in the book of Revelation, the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven. The powers of heaven will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming what? On the clouds. With great power and great glory. If you want to see the preview, the, the time just in anticipation of this coming uh, time of tribulation, go with me to Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7 we have this precursor to the tribulation and precursor to his return. In Daniel chapter 7 verse 13 
I was watching in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, and he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. He's coming, and he's going to set up his reign, and he's going to have his dominion over all, including the earth. He is the one like the Son of Man, and he came in this scene in heaven with the clouds. In uh, Exodus chapter 13, clouds literally are used by God to symbolize and evidence his presence in Exodus chapter 13. verse 21 and 22 and then the Lord went before them by day in what a pillar of cloud to lead the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so as to so as to go by day and night did not take away the pillar of cloud by the day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people so when the people were in the wilderness he appeared symbolically in this cloud to lead and guide and protect the people in the wilderness. In Exodus chapter 19, he again uses a cloud to manifest his appearance. Exodus chapter 19 and verse 16. He says, then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there was that there were thunderings and lightnings and a, what? a thick cloud on the mountain and the trumpet, the sound of the trumpet was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Where was this? Well, this was on Mount Sinai at the giving of the loud, excuse, giving of the law. There was a cloud present in Exodus uh, 33. You can see it's going to take us a while to get through this book. (laughs) Exodus 33 and verse 9. And it came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle that what? The pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses. Talked representing, being represented in this cloud or by this cloud. Some would say the Shekinah glory of God is represented by the glorious cloud that would go into the tabernacle and the temple. In 1 Kings, that's kind of what we see. 1 Kings uh, chapter 8 and verses... um, 10 and 11. And it came to pass when the priest came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord. This would be the Shekinah representing the glory of God so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. So God uses clouds in very interesting ways and uses a cloud to represent his presence in very profound ways in the giving of the law and in his presence in the tabernacle and the temple. And he is going to come with the clouds. And that is kind of what we're really looking for. Go with me to 1 Thessalonians In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, 
and 17 familiar scriptures. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. And that is our ultimate comfort because we think this event is going to precede all of these events in Revelation, which, again, we believe details out that last seven-year period before he returns, that, that time that's called the tribulation time. So clouds are important to the Lord and fascinating for us as we look at and anticipate his return in the clouds. First, to meet him in the clouds when he raptures out his church, and then to see him return in the clouds to earth to be fully glorified, to bring blessing and judgment, and to set up his reign here. Coming back to Revelation, then he says, uh, in the clouds and every eye will see. Uh, this again is just, want, you just need to be taken back to the reality of what this book is. This book is the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And while he has been revealed to us all the way through scripture, the anticipation of his first coming, the reality of his coming, the effect of his coming through all of the epistles, we have not seen him, and the world has not seen him, in the fullness of his glory. And that's what is going to happen. So the, the dichotomy is, is um, dramatic. Uh, the first time he came, uh, obscure, a, a, a baby uh, born in a manger in an obscure little village, and almost no one understood or witnessed that. And even in his ministry, it was limited to a very narrow geographical area. He did not move very far in terms of the scope of the world. And he was veiled in humanity. But not this time. This time, he comes back in his glory. And he will be visible to everyone. Everyone. He is coming back in his glory and the specificity of who he'll be visible to is included here. That is, every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. Who would that be? Well, that would be the Jewish people. They would, that would be the ones who crucified him. They were the ones that put him on the cross and they're going to see him together with all the tribes of the earth, and that would be all of the Gentile peoples of the earth, and there will be mourning. Now, in a very real sense, what this has to mean is there is going to be two types of mourning. There's going to be the mourning of those who say, what have we done to our Messiah? The mourning that is born out of a repentant heart uh, when they look on him, that would be the fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 13. Go with me. We've been there a few times, but in Zechariah chapter 13, remember, in speaking of his return, I'm sorry, Zechariah 12. 12 and verse 10, and I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will what? Look on me whom they pierced. Mm -hmm. Yes, and they will mourn for him who, as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one who grieves for his firstborn. So there are the true nation of Israel, the ones that God has made promises to save and redeem and complete the promises to Abraham in. <coughs> And then there are those that are not really Israel, and they will be mourning along with the Gentiles. They will be mourning out of fright and agony 
and even anger. Again, in Zechariah, he says, two-thirds shall be cut off in verse 8, and one-third shall be left in, and I will bring the one-third through the fire. That would be the, the nation that God is going to save, the nation of Israel fulfilling his promises. But again, the morning, therefore, would be for those that are repentant, that, uh, filled with mourning over what they have done, for those that are not repentant, filled with mourning out of um, fright and anger. And this would be the same case with uh, the Gentiles, because if you turn with me to Revelation chapter 7, in chapter 7, there's going to be 144,000 Jewish um, men chosen out of all the tribes of Israel who will be evangelists for the Lord in this period of time and they will go about sharing the gospel and the result of that is there's going to be a number of people saved both Jew and Gentile and you'll see that in verse 9 and these things I looked and behold a great number which no one could number all nations and tribes of the earth and tongues standing before the throne and before the lamb clothed with white robes with some palm branches those that are have been converted out of the tribulation those that are um, in this case, in heaven, but not all respond that way to uh, Christ. If you um, if you look at uh, not chapter nine, verse twenty and twenty one, after all of the initial forms of God's judgment. Um, the response of many, in fact, the response of most is n to not repent. It says, but the rest, verse 20, the rest of mankind who were not killed by the plagues did not repent of the works of their hands that they should not worship demons and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor talk. They did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality. We'll see that all the way through the this uh, this time of tribulation, they just did not repent. No matter what the evidence was, they did not repent. But when they see him come at the end of that time, there's going to be great mourning without repentance because they are going to be terrified and even angry because judgment has come on them for their failure to Repent. So the point here is, though, that Jesus is coming back revealed. That's what this book is, the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And his revelation is going to be his physical presence in glory. And everyone, everyone will see him. And the responses will be mourning by those who love him and, and have understood what they have done and repent and mourning by those who did not repent and are still his enemies. So John's response to that truth is, um, amen. That's, that's what our response is, right? Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Like I say, we believe for him to come here, he's got to come get us first, so... If one's coming, the other one's coming, and we're looking forward to it. I know some, uh, and I know I've always thought this for a long time too, some are a little hesitant to, to say, come Lord Jesus in the rapture and rapture us out, because they're concerned about those left behind, rightly so. But um, I'm not sure that's as big a concern as you think it is because we still have the tribulation period. If you don't go out with the church, you're going to enter the tribulation. That's not going to be fun, but you're still going to have an opportunity to come to Christ. It isn't like you've been closed out of heaven. So I think we can kind of unabashedly say, come Lord Jesus, and, uh, and take us home. Again, though, n not just because, um, you know, we get new bodies and you know, our hearts work right and our <laughs> hips don't hurt and our eyes see and, you know, and we don't, we don't have all of that problem. What, what we want is him to be glorified. That's what we want. And he'll be glorified when he takes his church out 
and he'll be glorified as we see the workings, the outworkings of his judgment and his blessings in the final years culminating in his return in blazing glory here. That's what we want. The Lord speaks here in verse 8 and confirms all of these things that John has said simply by announcing who he is. In verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Says the Lord who is and who was and who is to come. He is the Alpha and the Omega. That is the first and the last letter of the alphabet, the Greek alphabet. And what does that mean? Well, it's simple. All knowledge is contained in the alphabet of letters. The, uh, everything is written down using an alphabet. So the picture here is everything in the alphabet from the beginning to the end, he knows. He, he is the omniscient one. He is the alpha and the omega. There isn't anything that he doesn't know. There, there's, there's nothing in the past, present, or future that he does not know and understand. And he is the first, he is the beginning of all things. He is the last, that is, he is the culminator of all things. He is the creator and he is the judge and he is the sustainer. And he is the almighty. So he is going to do what he says he's going to do. If he started it, if he sustains it, if he knows everything, he knows how it's going to end because he's the one that's going to bring it about. He is, he is the Almighty and nothing that he says that's going to happen is going to be hindered or in any way stopped by anything. It is going to happen. He is coming. But only those who love him, and we saw that in 2 Timothy 4 8, who love his appearing, only those are going to be blessed. The others will be judged. Again, John identifies himself in, uh, in verse 9, again, to the recipients of his letter. He says, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here he identifies himself from a human standpoint by his name, John. And he doesn't say John the apostle. He, he doesn't say John the one that Jesus loved. He doesn't say John the author of the gospel. He doesn't say anything to identify him in any type of authority or um, elevated position of any kind. He just says, I, John, your brother. I mean, Paul does the same kind of thing. These, um, these amazing men of God that God used in such profound ways, they know that all they have and all they've done is only because what God has called them to do, empowered them to do, directed them to do. They're just, they're just channels for the truth and the blessings of God, just like we are. And so he identifies himself as just a brother. We are, we are companions. And we're not only brothers, family members, and companions, but we are companions in the common experience that we're having of persecution. We are all being persecuted, and I share in the sufferings that you are going through. This is a tough time. This is 95, 96 AD. All of the apostles are gone. All of them dead. All of them essentially killed for their faith. Except John. And John's on a little rock in the Aegean Sea as a prisoner because 
of the persecution against the church. The apostles are gone, and the church is in decline. In a, in a very real sense, we'll see it as, as the Lord takes inventory of his church in the next couple of chapters, we'll see that serious issues have entered into the church. Once again, this is only maybe uh, you know, 50 some years since the death of Christ, um, 60 years. And in that period of time, we've gone through a generation and things are not looking better. And in a very real sense, they're looking worse from a spiritual standpoint as you look at the church. So the church is under persecution, the church is spiritually weakening, and the apostles are gone. And the last apostle is an old man um, suffering as a criminal uh, for his faith. Things look bad for the church, and, and what, what John wants the church to know, and what he's going to be telling the church then, and the church now, and for all times, is that um, it's okay. See, I'm, I'm suffering in the tribulation, in the persecution, but we are brothers together and companions in that tribulation, but we are still primarily subjects of the king. We are in the kingdom. And so we are called to be patient in Christ. Patient because of Christ. Persevere in Christ. That's what he's calling them to do, and that's what he's saying he is doing as he is on the island that is called Patmos. And what he's saying is, I'm only here uh, because of the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. That island was a penal colony that Rome used to put criminals or anyone they considered a threat uh, to the empire. So John is saying, here's my crime, just as I know what your crime is in terms of the persecution you're going through. That is, you simply stood for the word of God and for the testimony of Christ. And you're paying the price for it. You're suffering the persecution for it. Now, in John's case, John is suffering under a persecution initiated by a guy named Domitian, who was the emperor at that time. It's interesting, Domitian is the younger brother of Titus. Titus is the one who destroyed Jerusalem and tore down the temple in 70 AD. Domitian is now the Caesar, the emperor. And the description of Domitian is he is a young madman. <laughs> Violent, evil madman who has initiated a statewide persecution of Christians. His ego is boundless. He is determined that he deserves to be worshipped. And one of the measures of that uh, is that he has asked and told the people in Ephesus to build a temple to him and offer sacrifices to him and worship him. And Ephesus is where John is. So we don't have the details, but it's not hard to understand that that's not something John would look kindly on. And it is that fact of his standing for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus that under this Domitian persecution he finds himself on Patmos, this island about 30 miles south of Ephesus and in the Aegean Sea. 
it is um, it is at that time official policy of Rome to persecute Christians. Yeah, the uh, the truth of it is though that whether it's the official policy of Rome or not, Christians have always been persecuted. So this is not an uncommon thing that John is experiencing. I mean, from the very beginning, Peter and John were jailed in Acts 4. The apostles were jailed in Acts 5. Stephen was stoned in Acts 6. Saul was, perse was persecuting the church in Acts 8. James was killed in Acts 12. All the apostles will ultimately die as martyrs, except John, who is still alive. Paul was promised by God that he would be persecuted in Acts 9. He escaped death in Damascus. He was stoned in Lystra. He was beaten in Philippi. He was forced out of Berea, mocked in Athens, nearly killed in the temple area in Jerusalem, imprisoned in Caesarea, and ultimately beheaded by Nero. Christians were always persecuted. Early on, between 33 and 64, Christians were fundamentally persecuted by other people, both Jewish people and Gentile people. They were not persecuted by the state, particularly. They just raised the ire of the people of the places that they went when they preached uh, the gospel. So the persecutions that the Christians suffered were, were varied depending upon where they were in the empire, as was the severity of it depending upon where they were in the empire. But persecution was not only allowed, but it was supported by the state because the Senate under Tiberius passed a law saying that it was to be illegal. It was an illegal superstition according to the Senate of Rome. Now this is interesting because this runs against Tiberius who was the Caesar at the time of Christ. It was Tiberius' desire that they not be persecuted, that they, he was trying to bring the empire together. He didn't need more trouble. So he was suggesting that we just leave them alone. But the Senate, overriding him, passed a law officially making the practice of Christianity illegal. But Tiberius put the word out not to enforce this very strictly, so there wasn't a lot that happened against them from an official standpoint until uh, 64 AD when Rome officially began to act against Christians under the reign of Nero. Because Nero, as we all know, blamed Christians for the burning of Rome. And Christians were tortured, thrown to wild animals, lit on fire, crucified, and again, Peter and Paul were both killed under Nero's persecution. Peter crucified upside down and Paul beheaded. Christians were easy targets for Nero to blame shift, you know, to create scapegoats. And they became easy targets for any emperor who wanted to do it down through the ages. Because Rome was pagan and they worshiped pagan gods. And they believed that the well-being of the state was dependent on the happiness of their gods. So when something went wrong, anything, any natural disaster, any threat from outside, it was very easy for them to say, see, this is evidence that the gods are unhappy because of those Christians who don't worship rightly. And the gods are angry. So we need to deal with those people. In addition to that, Christians were strange. And by that, they were different from the normal Roman citizen. They were gentle, kind, humble, 
people, all attitudes, virtues that Rome did not recognize and did not consider virtuous. They were different and therefore because they didn't participate in all of Roman life they were considered to be traitors to Rome, to the culture, to the empire, and ultimately criminals because they did not do what all good Romans did in participating in the pagan festivals and worship and frivolity. In addition to that, their meetings were secret, uh, so rumors grew, uh, grew that they were doing all kinds of bizarre things, particularly when they heard that they were celebrating the Lord's Supper like we just celebrated today. That gave rise to the rumor that they were cannibals. <laughs> and that's what they practiced in their worship services. But they're accused of many other horrific things which were totally without foundation. And of course they were accused of being disloyal uh, to the emperor because they claimed Jesus as their, as their king. Here's something you may not have known. They were considered potentially dangerous because their appeal primarily and in particularly in the early years was to lower class people and often slaves. Now again in Rome in many, as, as many as a third to a half of the whole population were slaves in one form or another. And so the early church uh, was made up of again for the most part lower class people in Rome's hierarchy and so the, the leadership had this concern that they in their popularity and in their membership might foment a slave a rebellion against the state. So they feared that kind of uprising and they looked at uh, Christians as potentially dangerous. In addition to that, all of that, in some places they were having uh, economic impact. Um, as in Ephesus, remember? They, they just put a major damper on the idol making business uh, because the power of the gospel was transforming lives and people were turning uh, from their idolatry. So for all of those reasons Christians were always easy targets uh, for any emperor that needed uh, someone to blame. When Nero's persecutions ended uh, Christians actually lived in peace for some period of time. They were never legalized, but there was no organized effort on the part of the state to go after them. But they lived in obvious uncertainty that it could come at any time because they were still considered legal. Um, and when Domitian came to power, the man we've talked about a couple of times, who was ruled from 81 to 96. He, once again, because of his ego and his desire to be worshipped, he turned on Christians and began another government-sponsored uh, persecution. Under that persecution, not only was John imprisoned, but, but uh, Polycarp, uh, one of the great early fathers of the church, the bishop at Smyrna, one of the churches we'll look at when we continue through the book, was, was martyred under this same uh, persecution. The next emperor up was uh, Marcus Aurelius. He, um, he was Caesar from 161 to 180 and again he once again after a little period of respite he once again took on an aggressive campaign against Christians, principally in the area of what is now modern day France. It was Gaul at that time. And under that persecution, Justin Martyr, another one of the early church fathers, was killed. But after his reign, Christians generally practiced openly with little persecution for upwards of 70 years or so. Um, and in that time, the gospel spread throughout the empire. Um, and had great impact, not only on lower class people, but moved through the classes and had a huge impact uh, within the empire un until 
um, until um, a guy named um, Dionysius came on the scene in 250 AD. Interesting man, really good for the empire. Um, the empire was disintegrating, uh, it was too big to manage, there were many inefficiencies, there was a lot going wrong from an administrative standpoint and they were threatened from the outside. And so Dionysius was a man who brought the empire under his control, solved some of the economic problems, uh, put more methods of uh, governance in place that were efficient. And part of that was he divided the empire into four sections um, because it was too unwieldy. And that became the precursor uh, 20 years later of the final division of the Roman Empire between East and West, one headquartered in Rome and one headquartered in Constantinople. And by that move, added another 500 years to the power of the empire. When Rome fell around 500 AD, Constantinople stayed in power for another um, 500 years or so. So he did some really good things, but he was terrible for the church terrible for the church and he initiated one of the most violent and one of the most all-encompassing persecutions of Christians that had been seen to that date. He literally set out to wipe out our Christianity and Lord only knows how many people died under his uh, reign of terror which didn't stop until about the early 300s when a man named Constantine came uh, to the fore and became the emperor of Rome. Constantine, uh, in one of the turning point battles that led to his rise to power, had some type of a vision. In that vision, Eusebius says um, it was a vision of a cross. Uh, someone else denies that, but whatever that vision was, it had some major impact on Constantine because he saw it as the Christian God's sign that he would be victorious. It came in response to his, please let me have victory, God, and whatever he saw moved him to the point of submitting himself to Christ. Now there's great debate as to whether he was actually a Christian or not. There's some kind of strange things in his belief system, but uh, whatever it was, he was transformed. And that's one of the strongest arguments that he actually was a Christian. There was no reason for him to do what he did. There was no advantage to him uh, at that time uh, to be a Christian because they were coming out of Diocletian's persecutions. I mean, Christians were hated. And that was the official position of Rome. So. Uh, you have to give Constantine at least a, to cut him a little bit of slack, but for but for whatever reason, uh, he he uh, made a major change. And in the what was called the Edict of Milan, and in, in 313, he legalized the Christian faith. So no more uh, persecution. Uh, in 324, Theodosius made Christianity the official religion of the state. So persecution ended with Constantine. And then the Christianity was kind of pulled into a partnership with the state in 324 when it was made the, the official religion of the Roman Empire. And while that may seem good, it wasn't <laughs> because um, it didn't take long before the Roman Church took the place of the Roman state in persecuting Christians. The numbers of Christians killed by the Roman church is difficult to get your hands around or, or get any comfort level in because the numbers vary wildly. Um, one historian claimed there could have been as many as 50 million Christians killed from 600 to the mid-1800s. That's probably beyond realism. Don't think that makes sense. But we do know in medieval times that, uh, that popes specifically targeted 
Christian groups for slaughter. Uh, they include the men and women who followed John Wycliffe in the 1300s, um, the Hussites in Czechoslovakia, the Waldensians in Italy, the Albigenians in France. In fact, the Waldensians and the Albigenians were ordered exterminated by Pope Innocent III. <laughs> How you like that? So these deaths are, are pretty, the, 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 the range of, of possible deaths is still large, like from 200,000 to a million, but whatever that is, it is a major effort on the part of the Roman church to wipe out Christians. There's another 100,000 to 300,000 that are estimated to have died uh, in the inquisitions in both France and Spain maybe three to five thousand of them actually executed in the Inquisition, but the rest died as a result of the torture and the imprisonment uh, um, under those uh, Inquisitions. And then in the 1500s, of course, the Protestant Reformation resulted in uh, the continuation of those Inquisitions and maybe the acceleration uh, of them, and a number of godly men were, and women were killed uh, in uh, Rome's attempt to put down the Reformation. Um, I don't know if you included in the numbers that lost their lives because of Rome's persecution, but in the 1618 to 1648 there were a series of wars called the Thirty Year Wars in Europe. Um, it was a war of Catholics against Protestants. Again, the Catholic Church setting out to stamp out what they considered to be a heresy, and the estimates on deaths there are four to eight million people, 700,000 to a million in the war itself, and then the, 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 the um, attendant disease and wounds uh, would account for the balance of them. So Rome uh, became, in a sense, um, taken over in the persecution of Christians by the church in Rome. But that's not all, that's the only place that Christians are persecuted. I mean, it's not just the Catholic Church. Christians have been persecuted by the communists and by the Muslims and by the Hindus and by the atheists and, you know, the, the statement that the blood of the martyrs has been the seed of the church is profound and true. Some estimate that 70 million Christians have been killed throughout church history, a good portion of them in the 20th century to the present. And I'm here to tell you it's not going to get better. <laughs> We're going to see in the tribulation as we move through the book of Revelation that millions more are going to die persecuted in the tribulation. So all of that to say that while John writes to this church at a time when things aren't looking well, John is calling us and them and himself to not lose heart because this is what's always happened. And God has not left the throne. And this is not outside the plan. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the Almighty. And He will make it right. So, just be patient. Persevere. Don't worry about what the they can do you here in this life. Just set your eyes on Him. Trust in Him. And look for His return. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time. Thank you for your church. Thank you for your faithfulness to your church. Thank you for the saints that have persevered in the face of such horrific persecution. Give us the same courage. Give us the same zeal for your truth. Lord, give us the grace to endure whatever comes. Help us never, never to lose hope to think that somehow things are out out of control because you are the Almighty. You are 
the Alpha and the Omega. You are the beginning of the end. And you are coming. We know that, Lord. Please, come quickly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.